Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to bring you an episode on our favorite productivity tips for office suites and other tools that we use. I'm going to start, Adam. One of my favorite productivity tips that I tell people all the time is a feature in Outlook called the Ignore feature. And so this comes in handy because people will send out that welcome email or congratulatory email or some sort of email where they blast it to a bunch of people in the to field or the B in the C CC field or it's a distribution list. And inevitably someone hits the reply all. And so that usually will start a chain of other people replying all, and maybe someone replies all and says, don't reply all. And, you know, you just go down the rabbit hole. So there's this great feature that as soon as I see one of those emails come out, I go to my Outlook. I right-click the email, and they, there's a, an option called ignore. And what that does is it ignores all subsequent replies or sends of that particular chain and automatically deletes them. So really, really great for my sanity. Unfortunately, it's only available on the Windows version of Outlook. So if you're a Mac user or a Outlook mobile user, this particular function hasn't rolled over to those clients yet, but on Windows Outlook, it is available as well as OWA. So you can go to OWA, right-click the email as well, and hit ignore. So one of my favorite features, I tell people all the time about it because I'm sure, like you and me, we've all been in those situations where we've gotten an email and it's blasted out and people reply all and it just starts this chain of events. So. Actually, real-time follow-up, in the new Outlook on the Mac, there is now Ignore Conversation. So it's finally made its way to the Mac. Hallelujah. And it is an awesome feature. Nice. Um, and, and like Andy said, I think the number one use case, at least inside of Microsoft, will be inevitably you get the welcome John Doe to Microsoft. And then everyone replies, welcome, John. Welcome, John. Welcome, John. And I mean, it's it's complete noise. And so you can read the message and then you can even preemptively before the reply apocalypse starts uh, do that ignore conversation and it'll take care of any subsequent messages in the thread because you know they're going to be low value. And so super, super, super handy tool. And again, if you can't get to it on whatever platform you're on, Outlook Web App or Outlook Online, Outlook on the Web, whatever you call it these days has that feature. So that's a good one. Next one, my turn, uh, is ability to send your availability. So of course, you get asked all the time, like, hey, when are you available to meet? And then you pull up your calendar and you start typing in, well, all these are central daylight time, UTC minus five. And then you start putting in all the times. Outlook Mobile on iOS and Android actually is an awesome feature where you can just send your availability. It will literally pop up your calendar. You drag your finger on the times you want to offer up. So by the way, it's not just doing hard coded like free busy. You actually get to pick but you do it while you're looking at a visual representation of your calendar. Because if there's something that's blocked, but like for this person, you would overbook it for them. It's super easy to do with this tool. So honestly, it's one of those features that needs to get ported back to like the big boy versions of Outlook on the Mac and PC, uh, because it's an awesome, awesome feature on Outlook mobile. And kind of on that same vein, there are different tools to help with scheduling. So two from Microsoft in particular that do kind of different things. So I'll talk about one and Andy, I'll have you talk about the other. Um, I love calendar.help, which is essentially a version of Cortana that helps with scheduling. 
And anybody, I think, can sign up today. You go to calendar.help. It actually supports both Microsoft email as well as Google email. So you don't even have to be on Office 365 to use it. But what's amazing about it is that it's going to have visibility into all of your teammates' calendars, you know, assuming their free busy settings are appropriate. And it, it understands plain language. So you can say, hey, Cortana, schedule some time for me to meet with Andy next week. And Cortana will take that request, compare my calendar, look at Andy's calendar, and find, say, the first available time slot for us to meet next week. And it will respect, like, my working hours, my lunch hours, and all of that automatically. And if she picks a time that I don't like, I can reply back and say, actually, that, that doesn't work. Push that out to Thursday, and it'll do that. So amazing feature, especially, again, when you're on the go on your mobile device, where you don't have to get on, again, big boy outlook and pull up five different calendars and do a manual compare. You can just do a natural language kind of thing to Cortana and she'll schedule it for you, which is amazing. Where it doesn't work as well are going to be scenarios where Cortana does not have visibility into people's calendars. So when you send it to people outside the company. Now, what it does that's cool is it'll pick up like three different options from your calendar and to the people outside the company, we'll offer them up. So it'll say, hey, here's times that Andy is available or Adam is available. Now, here's where it gets a little challenging. What will inevitably happen is, let's say you invite three different people and Cortana sends three different options. Your three invitees won't read the email where it says you should, you should re reply with all of the times that work for you, that keyword being all, and will instead just cherry pick one. And then the thing I've seen happen where this makes me kind of have um, uh, crow in my face is that they will all three pick different times. And then Cortana will come back to me and go, I don't know what to do because each one of them is available at a different time. So, you know, I think it's better personally for internal meetings where Cortana has visibility into everyone's calendar, super slick. But I actually think there's a better tool when you're trying to schedule with people outside the company. Andy, can you talk about find time a little bit? Yeah, find time is one of those things that I like to use in that specific instance. I didn't actually know that calendar.help works for people outside your company because I assumed that Cortana needed options but it's kind of cool that it, they'll actually get sent an email with those times and and cortana will just take their reply hopefully the person reads the email and does the thing mm -hmm. but find time works great for people outside the company and within the company too i mean mm -hmm. it's it's used for both but you can send it's a free plugin that you can add to your outlook and you can send them a poll and you pick the times, so say, for example, I'm available at 9 a.m. on a Monday, I'm available at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, and I'm available at 2 p.m. on Friday. And you send them these times, and you can pick as many as you want. Generally, I try not to pick too many because that gets tedious as well. So I usually pick about three to maybe four times at most, and then I send them to the people who are absolutely necessary to be on the meeting. That's key. Big tip. That's because, key. <laughs> because if you send it to a bunch of people, the, the way it works is every single person has to answer the poll and then the meeting gets scheduled. So if you send it to 10 people, 10 people have to answer the poll. If they're not absolutely necessary to be on the meeting, then the best thing to do is just schedule it and send the poll to the people who need to be on the meeting. Once the meeting gets scheduled, you can forward it on to those people who might not have to be on the meeting, and if they can make it, they make it. If they can't, they can't. Mm -hmm. So find time is great. It is great for a smallish group of people who are actively going to reply to the poll. If you don't reply to the poll, the meeting actually never gets completed or, or scheduled. Another thing is there is an option within find time to tentatively block your schedule. I like to turn this on personally because if you're someone who gets scheduled for meetings all the time, which I do, then if I give you a time right now and I say I'm free on Wednesday at 1 p.m., in the next 10 minutes, that time slot might be filled, right? And so 
having find time, if I pick that time and put it in a poll, it technically blocks my schedule as tentative until the poll is completed. Once the poll is completed and the meeting gets scheduled, find time will then remove the tentative blocks that were there that aren't part of that poll. So I like to do that. Some people don't. Um, but for me, it's a benefit because my calendar fills up so fast that if I give you a time right now, 10 minutes later, it might be filled. And if I didn't block it with a tentative, it would show available. So really great tool to use for a small group of people who are actively going to reply back to the poll. Uh, that made me think of two things, one on find time and one on calendar.help. On find time, to Andy's point, it will not automatically schedule the meeting until you have everyone weighed in. However, if you've gotten a clear kind of consensus, like in the final votes aren't going to sway your decision making, like at this point where it's going to be at this time, you can manually at any point, go ahead and click the time you want and it will just cancel the poll and schedule it. So that requires human interaction. You kind of have to babysit the poll, but certainly there is the option to we're close enough, you know, four out of five people have responded and they all pick the same time. So whatever, um, Bob picks doesn't matter, right? We're going to go ahead with that time. So that's a good option. And one other thing about calendar.help where it is useful for people outside your company is Cortana is very cordial and very professional, but what she is also is very persistent. And so if you're trying to schedule with someone who has a tendency not to respond, Cortana is like honey badger and she will keep going after them professionally but say, hey, Bob, I haven't heard from you yet. I need you to respond. Andy and Jane are awaiting your response so we can schedule this meeting. And she'll come back every day uh, for like three days and keep badgering them to respond. And it's kind of a way where since it's not a person doing it, it plays better. So if you ever have someone who's like really difficult to nail down, that is a good use case for calendar.help where put Cortana on them and she will professionally pester them until they respond. And I love that feature. So two additional thoughts there. My next productivity tip was actually something that I got from Shannon Fritz who was on our show a couple weeks ago. And he told me about the ability to categorize calendar events. And that's not something that I've done previously or even knew that I could do. I think the option has always been there, but what's great about it is that you can create categories within Outlook. And I've always used these for emails. So you can categorize an email and it shows up and you can search by categories. But if you do this for calendar events, it color codes the block for the color, for the calendar event, which is visually really, really helpful when you're looking at your calendar. So for example, now my calendars look like I have blocks for say personal time or I have blocks where it's a meeting where I need to speak up and I need to lead or I'm an active participant. And then I have meetings where I'm just a passive listener. And so those meetings that I'm a passive listener, I know that I can maybe take it on my phone or take a break or, or do something while I'm actually doing that meeting because I'm not expected to have any input. I also have blocks where it's, you know, stuff that I need to do personally for like picking up my kids or my lunch break or things like that. So it's really nice. Cause I can look at my calendar and for Shannon, you know, he's at Microsoft and he's dealing with customers and, and talking to customers. For me, I have one specifically for vendors. So I color code it and I know, okay, I'm talking to a vendor at this time. And I'm sure, uh, you know, you can do the same thing for say, if you're talking to a customer. So you know that you're leading a conversation with a customer, you're, uh, you're leading a conversation with a team. And so it's just a nice visual way of glancing at your calendar and knowing these are the events I have coming up. And without having to read each event, you know the color code and what category it belongs to. I had not at all. So I, I've done this before. And I have to admit, I kind of got lazy and stopped doing it. But I, I love the visual. It's super helpful. But I had never thought of, I think, the way you just described using it for delineating between meetings where I'm an active participant versus a passive participant. Because this is something, I'll, I'll be candid, I could do a better job at trying to get away from the desk, get up, walk around, go for a walk, 
bring your phone with you, bring some earbuds, hey, Surface Buds, um, whatever you got, AirPods, um, and just listen to that meeting while you're taking your dog for a walk or something, right? I mean, there's there's some great opportunities with the nicer weather and with working from home where we can do things we never could before. And that's an awesome idea where, I mean, how much of a quality of life improvement is that? I mean, as much as I personally am excited to get back in the office at least sometimes, but that's something, you know, sitting in a meeting as a passive participant is the worst. And that's a really cool uh, tip, maybe not so much a productivity tip, but just like a life hack for taking advantage of working from home where, hey, if I'm not sitting on a meeting and I and I see like, Andy, maybe you've got in purple or whatever, I've got a big block of purple, I'm going to go, you know, go for a two mile walk while I listen to these meetings. And, you know, I can still pipe in where appropriate. There's good audio in a lot of these, you know, ear pods or whatever. So I think that's, um, that's a really cool tip. And I really, really like that in particular. My next tip is also something that I use quite frequently. I think the feature is also still on the Windows version of Outlook, unless it's it's also one of those new things on the new Outlook for Mac. But mm-hmm. for sure it's on Windows. I'm sure they're going to translate some of that feature at some point to other clients. But it's called conditional formatting. And what this is, is if you go into the tab for View and then Format, there's something called conditional formatting where you can specify certain conditions and then format that email to look like a certain way. So for example, I have a rule that if an email comes from my boss or my coworker, the two people who are most important that I need to take a look at that email, I need to respond to that email. It is, and the rules get applied in order of importance so the the higher the rule on the formatting list those will get applied first so this rule is the first thing on my list and that is if it's coming from my boss or my coworker, it gets formatted in purple color and the font is slightly larger so just at a glance i can look at all the list of emails and i know that in purple that's my boss and that's my team I need to respond to that. I also have another one that comes if I'm in the to field and I'm the only person in the to field. So I know that that was sent just to me. I also have another one for if I'm in the to field with other people. So it's a mass email that I'm in the to field. And then that's it. Because if I'm not in the to field or it's not from my boss, then it probably isn't important. It probably means I'm on the CC field or I'm on some distribution list or something like that. So I love the conditional formatting. I've used these for executives as well. It's another one of those life hacks for executives because maybe executives are getting hundreds of emails all the time, right? But one of our VPs, when I was working with her, she wanted to know when the CEO emailed her or one of the other VPs emailed her because she gets hundreds of emails. She has no time to sort through them. And so I said, well, you can use this conditional formatting. And then all of a sudden, if the CEO sends you something, it'll show up in red or whatever color you pick. So that was something that was super helpful. Mm -hmm. If you're one of those people who just gets an inordinate amount of email using conditional formatting and having that visual cue, just like with your calendar, is really helpful. You know, I've heard a variation of that tip as well, where... Conditional formatting might be limited to just Outlook on Windows. I I don't know, by the way. I mean, keeping the feature matrix of different versions of Outlook in your head is tricky. But rules, especially server-side rules, you can set up in Outlook web app, and they'll, of course, they fire on the server side, so you see them everywhere. And so you'll see variations of this tip where people will do variations of, if I'm in the to field, bring it to my inbox. If I am not in the to field, then put it in like inbox two or something like to review later. And basically you manage your inbox very frequently, but that secondary mailbox you look at more infrequently because if you are CC'd or you're on a distro or you just weren't directly addressed, then it's not as important. Um, That requires, of course, for your company to have a relatively healthy email culture where, by the way, if you didn't know this, the accepted um, 
guidance on this is that if somebody needs to take a direct action as a result of an email, then they should be on the to field. If they just need to have it for awareness, then they should be on the CC field. And so that's where if people follow that rule, then those mail rules or conditional formatting we talked about make a ton of sense. If you have a less mature email culture where people kind of treat to and CC as interchangeable, these might not work for you. Um, but there's opportunities for education. Hey, you know, that you could potentially do to help with that. But I've, I've heard them, I've never had the guts to do like that sweep everything in another mailbox concept, but I'm always tempted to try it. I wonder how well it would work. You may notice that if you ever do like an at name of somebody in Outlook, like if I do at Andy Jaw, it automatically puts them in the to field. Because the assumption is if you're calling them out in an at, then they should be in the to field. So there's there's actual logic built into Outlook that kind of reiterates this point. Another tool that I think is super helpful for me is something called Whiteboard. It's not something that a lot of people use, but I find it to be much better at conveying messages, even in a meeting format. Some people like to whiteboard real time. I like to actually use whiteboard to draw out ideas and concepts and use them to lead meetings. It is much more engaging, in my opinion, than creating a PowerPoint. PowerPoint slides just look very dull. They're very boring. I like to sketch out my whiteboard and use it kind of like as a PowerPoint replacement. But then what's nice is during the meeting, I bring up, you know, my one slide, you know, my whiteboard, so to speak, with its pre-drawn ideas and, and concepts and everything. And I talk off of that, but I can then in real time draw and change things on the whiteboard as we're discussing things. So it does require some touchscreen device. I mean, you can do it with the mouse. It's not as agile with the mouse. I've tried it. Um, but with a touchscreen, with a stylus, if you have an iPad, you can download the whiteboard app on an iPad or other tablet. It's in the Android store as well. You could do it on your phone. Um, so it's one of those tools that doesn't get used that often. But if you can get good at whiteboarding, I think number one, it's a great replacement for PowerPoint. It has, you know, colors and, and, and a way to customize your ideas in visual format that just pop much better than creating just another PowerPoint slide. And then it's a great way to lead conversations digitally in, in the COVID age and being remote and having these remote meetings you kind of miss that like whiteboard session, you know, in, in a room where you're actually doing that, but you can do it digitally and it's an app that's included with your office 365 suite. Love whiteboard. And honestly, as somebody who has had terrible handwriting my whole life, I, I was hesitant to adopt it because I, I got into computers because I liked being able to type better. I thought that was a better way to communicate. But gosh, Andy, you're you're so right that there is there is an immediacy and a differentiation to whiteboarding that it captures people's attention, but it also there's just some messages that get conveyed so much easier with whiteboard. And I've seen it used a number of different ways, Andy. You kind of described that you really like to get it all mapped out ahead of time. And then you can use it to illustrate your point. You can, of course, make changes, delete, add more, highlight while you're going through it. One interesting idea I've heard, and this is really clever, is that Whiteboard has a really rich undo capability. It's actually, I believe it's cloud-backed is how it works. So you can actually go back into a Whiteboard later, and I think you can even undo stuff from like a previous session. But anyhow, there are folks at Microsoft who will... Um, draw everything out, then undo it all, and then tap redo to like build it out, like almost like a build in PowerPoint by just hitting that redo button to go forward and step through their previous steps again, which is like a super clever and crazy way to use the tool that maybe it wasn't designed to do, but you might be able to think of some use cases to take advantage of that as well. 
And hey, for people who have bad handwriting, and Andy actually taught me this, I didn't even know about it, you can draw the lasso around your handwriting and do the magic wand, and it will turn it into beautiful handwriting, and it looks great. And and like Andy said, it's cross-platform, it's on Surface Hub, it's on Windows, it's on the web, it's on iOS. So uh, most platforms you're on, you can probably get it. Of course, it's going to be best if you have some sort of touch and especially touch and stylus experience like Apple Pencil or Surface Pen are going to be the best ways to experience whiteboard. But I've seen people who are really good with the finger. I've seen people who are really good with the mouse. So whatever's going to work for you, but it's a different tool to not only convey thoughts ahead of time, but also capture thoughts in real time as well. I've taken to just using it as we're, we're talking like write down ideas, write down directly responsible individuals and kind of use it to add some structure to meetings and people really respond to it. Cause like you said, it brings back that experience of sitting in a room together. And finally it supports real-time co-authoring and collaboration. So you can have a whiteboard and you can invite other people in your organization to co-author it with you. So you can literally be whiteboarding while somebody else is doing it on the same whiteboard at the same time. So lots of options, lots of tools there. It's a deeper tool than you think. So it's definitely worth exploring. Even if you're like me, and traditionally, like, hate your handwriting, hate doing things by hand, you know, wanted to get all digital. And what are we doing going back to, like, this analog, like, paper and pen kind of model? But gosh, there's just some humanity to it, some some information sharing to it that's so raw and real. And with so much death by PowerPoint and Zoom and Teams and everything else, it's just different. And people will be drawn to it. And you will get a more engaged meeting when you use it. I promise you that. Yeah, when I've brought up the ones that I've drawn before, I noticed, you know, it's it's just internal within my team, but I've noticed immediately like they kind of sit up and like, oh, this is this is new. What is this? Mm-hmm. Right? Like you didn't just make up a little PowerPoint slide or a visual, um, a visual chart or something like that. This is this is a hand drawn thing. That's mm-hmm. cool, mm-hmm. you know. And then you go through it and and you get a little bit more engagement. So I definitely think, like Adam said, that it's worth exploring. Mm-hmm. Uh, another tool that I use daily that is also included with the Microsoft suite is something called to do. And that is one of my favorite to do list task trackers. Um, you know, there's a lot of apps out there that kind of do the same thing, but to do is included with your office 365 subscription. It's included with MSA. It's a free app. You can use it, I think, even without signing in. When you sign in on, with your MSA, you get the sync, you know, and the saving. So uh, I think it's it's a great app. It It's exactly what you think it would be. You're able to enter in tasks, and you check them off. And each task, you can enter in notes. You can enter in URLs. You can add multiple subtasks to a specific task. You can create multiple lists. You can even add in files or JPEGs or clip art or whatever you need to, to a specific task and you can color code them. And so it's a great way for me to keep track of the things I need to do. I have a list of work tasks. I have a list of personal tasks. You can categorize them. You can make them favorites. You can make them important for the specific day. You can even have recurring tasks that will come up each time, each day, or whatever it is, and it'll come up as a task. I use this also as a tracker for articles that I come across. So I know that we had Gavin on a few weeks ago, And we were chatting about all the different information that we get for security professionals and the news and tips and tricks and articles that we read that we're like, oh, yeah, I I need to read through that. Like if I find a a specific security article that talks about, you know, configuration for Linux or something like that, or then I come across another article that Alex Weinhardt writes about the new cool thing that Microsoft is doing with identity, you know, I, I... I don't have time to read all of them in depth, so I just copy and I put it on a on a to-do list. And when I read it, I check it off. So one of my favorite tools that I use every single day. 
To do kind of follows the Microsoft playbook from Outlook Mobile, which was an acquisition of a product called Accompli. And Accompli was a pretty great email client. Now, Outlook is a really great email client on mobile. Um, to do was an acquisition of Wunderlist. And, you know, it was written almost like German style. So it was like Wunderlist, but uh, it it was already a pretty well-liked app. And, and Microsoft really, um, I think, took what was good about Wunderlist and just kind of made it better. It's it's a really nice, really clean app. There's there's not a lot of accoutrement there. I mean, it, it is what it is, like Andy said. And um, it's available on all the things. It's available on the web, on iOS, on Android. So wherever you need it, you can get it. And it's slick. It's good. So another tool that I've used in the past, I haven't been using it as much, but certainly a really, really great tool to use is called Microsoft Planner. And what it is is more of like kind of to-do times 100, right? It's it's kind of like a to-do list, but even better where it's almost Kanban-like if you're into that project management type flow where you can have different buckets and each specific quote unquote task can be broken down into multiple tasks. It can have due dates and you can have people assigned to it from your team. And it's almost a project management tool that is like a project management light, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So if you're not, you don't need a full on, Gantt chart and milestones and all this other stuff, then you can use planner and really dial in the tasks for your specific group projects that you're tracking. I was doing this as a project management for just myself of things that I was doing. Like for example, I had a, a particular bucket for password list things where I would go in and I'd say, okay, I need to review password list authentication for Microsoft. I need to review password list list authentication for Okta. And then which within those specific ones, I would have subtasks to check different settings. And then I'd have due dates. And that was used when I talked with my boss on a one-on-one, -on -one, he was asking me, you know, what have you done this week? I could go back to that particular planner, look at all the different projects that I was working on myself, all the different tasks that I completed that week. I can say, this is, these are all the things that I did. So, it's a great way to do not only project management for yourself, if you're having a hard time keeping track of all the things that you're doing, but also if you invite people to that particular planner in collaboration, I can assign Adam a specific task. I can say, okay, on this particular project, on this particular task, I need you to do this and this is due within this date. Mm -hmm. So good for uses among a team as well. Basically, if you've ever said one of two things, gosh, I wish there was some sort of project management in Microsoft Teams, there is, it's called Planner. Or if you've ever said, you know, Microsoft should make like a light version of Microsoft Project that's not as heavy or as complex, that's Planner. So it's again, it's included with like practically every Microsoft 365 subscription, like E3 or whatever. Um, you probably already have it. And it's built into Teams. It actually uses the same group, like underlying group as Teams. So you don't have to build out a different group if you've already got a team stood up. It's super easy to add a planner to it and get started. So it's um, it's kind of one of those hidden gems of M365 that people don't know they have. And your IT may have disabled it. I hope not. But it's worth looking into because it's a really powerful tool and, and can just be a different way to help manage projects and get them done. Yeah, I think I actually recommended it to one of our technical business analysts who are tagged along with one of the business departments, and they're supposed to analyze the, the needs and come up with different tools. And they were asking about a project management tool, and I was like, well, have you seen Planner? Have you tried that? And it was exactly what they needed, You know, something that was included that did not cost additional uh, funds and uh did everything that they needed from a project management standpoint. Mm -hmm. So the final tool that I have on my list is a tool called Power Automate. So this used to be called Flow, Microsoft Flow, if you're familiar with that. Um, I'm going to talk about one aspect of it, and then Adam, you know, if you have some stuff that you can add. But mm -hmm. I've used this in the past, again, for our executives. It's actually been a really, really powerful tool 
that I've helped them build out different processes. So for example, I don't want any of my corporate emails being forwarded anywhere else. That's something that in a security world, you don't want auto forwards on emails. But because of the executives getting so many emails, right? We talked about that before with the conditional formatting. They wanted certain emails to kind of ping them, right? So they would forward them to their cell phones. And if you're not familiar with this, you can actually do like, you know, your phone number at vtex.com or att.com. You know, each phone number has a way, actually, an email that you can forward to to actually get it as a text. And so they would forward emails from, say, the CEO or from specific people that they wanted to know because they turned off notifications completely for their email because they get so many. And then when they get an email from that particular VIP, they would forward it to their cell phone. Well, we didn't want them forwarding corporate emails to unsecured SMS texts, right? So I helped them build a Power Automate flow which was really simple to do. You know, there's one that's actually built in there that says VIP. So it's if you get an email from this person, send a notification to the app. Now you do have to have the Power Automate app on your phone and allow notifications, but it comes in as a notification just the same way as a text would. And so you can keep notifications off for Outlook and then the Power Automate rule will trigger if email received from Adam Brewer send notification, right? So that that's one simple way that I've done Power Automate rules. There's so many other things. I know I've used Power Automate for for Teams as well. You can send a message to a Teams channel. You can send an email to something if something gets triggered. I've used it for Azure Sentinel. When a certain alert comes in, send me a Teams message in, in our Teams chat. And so there's a lot of different things that you can do, and those are kind of just the simple ones. And I know that Power Automate expanded some features recently. Are you able to talk about that, Adam? Yeah, and I'm not super deep in this, but we'll just give people a taste, and if they're interested, they can go dig deeper. So recently, a Power Automate desktop app rolled out. And if you've ever done this in the past where you've had like a macro recording tool where you're like, record this, I'm going to go click here, click here, click here, now repeat that. Um, that's kind of a gross simplification, but if you want that sort of thing on the desktop, Power Automate now is an app that can do something like that. And again, I'm not super crisp on the details, but there's some capability there. Just know that Power Automate scales like really broadly from kind of some of those simple if this then that kind of tools. Like if you've ever used IFTTT and you basically want like a native Microsoft thing so your security team's happy, that's Power Automate, that's what it is. But it also can be the really powerful workflow engine where you have a very complex workflow where this thing comes in and you're going to put it in a Power BI dashboard and then you're going to upload it to a OneDrive and you're going to do this, that, and the other thing. Like You can do complex like business automation here as well um, in Power Automate. So it's, it's a really interesting tool. You'll hear Microsoft talk about Power Platform and Power Automate is part of that. The other kind of piece of it is Power Apps, which is like a low-code, no-code solution for making um, really quick and dirty apps. So a couple quick examples of how we use Power Apps in Microsoft that I've run into recently. Number one, we have a Power App that sole purpose is to populate all of the company holidays on your Outlook calendar. And it can also populate all of the paydays on your Outlook calendar. So that's a super handy power app. And then there's a power app I just ran into where if you've created a new service account and you want to provision it to be like a Surface Hub account for a conference room, you go to a power app and fill out a couple of options and click a button and it does that. So there's kind of a, 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 a scale here where all the way from really simple, like Andy said, like if it's from this sender, then send a push notification to the mobile app all the way up to really complex processes. Power platform might be a way for you to automate that or simplify that with very little or no code. Um, so I'll, I'll just broaden it, not just power automate the whole power platform is something you should look into. If you're, if you're trying to scratch an itch and, and automate something or simplify something you hear like RPA a lot nowadays this is that in, in some ways. And, and it's 
there's some other capabilities as well. So look into Power Platform if you've got a, a problem that needs solved and, and you haven't been able to find a way to do it. As Adam said, it's it doesn't require any coding. There, the mm -hmm. flows are actually fairly simple mm -hmm. to to build out. The functions are all built in, and um, you can find uh, find pretty much what you need without getting super deep into the actual code. So, really, really powerful tool all the way from you know the simple to the to business complex automation. You know, Andy, we're just going to have to name this episode Microsoft 365 Productivity Tips. And that's fine. <laughs> we, could do, we could do other productivity tips some other time, but we basically, this is just N365, which is cool. People, a lot of people use it. So there you go. This was fun. Well, that's all I had for this week. Mm -hmm. If you guys have other tips, I, honestly, I would love to hear from them. I think both of us would love to hear your productivity tips. If you have any tips tricks that we haven't heard of in in microsoft suite or anything else and you want us to talk about it i would love to hear about it i love learning about other little tips and tricks uh, that can make my life easier mm -hmm. same here send them our way it's amazing it, um people often say like a, a predictor of success as a computer programmer is laziness you have to have that desire to automate things as much as possible or simplify things. And gosh, people come up with some clever tips and tricks along the way. So share your goodies with us and, and our audience. Well, that's our episode for this week. Thanks for listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. Reach out to us if you have any security topics that you want us to talk about or have questions about this show. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.